Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a lecture theatre without a clock, so I'll just... Uh, and I want a very tight time schedule, so I'll just put my watch where I can see it. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, current research at Manchester, which runs under the heading of this grand challenge, Building Brains, understanding how the human brain works and how we may replicate some of that functionality inside artificial machines. But before that, you're probably all wondering um, who I am. So um, here's a bit of ancient history. How many people in the room have ever heard of the BBC Micro? Yes, you're all showing your age. Um, this is nearly 30 years ago now. Um, the introduction of the home computer revolution in the UK. And at that time, I worked at Acorn and was involved in the development of this machine which really introduced computers into our schools. Um, th that's my view of the BBC Micro, uh, probably not the one you're most used to seeing, if you've seen it at all, uh, but I'm into the hardware, the, the chips and circuits that make the machines work. So um, in this case, there's the microprocessor, which is the engine room of the BBC Micro. And on the BBC Micro, we designed a couple of fairly simple bespoke chips um, to give it a bit more functionality for the money. And ever since then, this was about 1981, ever since then, I've been designing more and more complicated microchips. And uh, we'll see where that's led. Uh, I was also involved at Acorn in the development of the ARM microprocessor. Uh, my guess is that there are probably about as many ARM processors as there are people in this room at the moment. Uh, because the chances are you have one in your mobile phone, which of course you've turned off, um, and in your iPod, which of course you're not listening to. Um, the ARM processor um, hit a sweet spot in the industry development of, of um, particularly consumer goods, uh, systems on a chip, where all the electronics pretty much is, is compressed onto a single chip. And ARM was formed as an independent company in 1990, and uh, really rode the wave of development of system-on-chip technology. It's a very simple processor, and, and that made it well-suited to this area of development. And um, there's the processor. You see it's a very small part of this chip, um, so there's a lot more functionality on there uh, than just the processor. The rest of it is supporting different bits of the system. Major milestone, um, by the beginning of 2008, over 10 billion ARM processors had been shipped. Um, this is a, has become a significant uh, UK success story. Um, by my estimation, there's now more ARM computing power on the planet than all other computers made by all other companies ever put together. And yet even in the UK, most people are relatively unaware of this because these processors are just hidden inside um, the little toys we carry around in our pockets. Uh, here's a sort of random fact. I think this is a sort of Douglas Adams type coincidence. Um, if you take those 10 billion ARM processors, which is a pretty big number, um, and you look at what they're built from, they're made of transistors. Each one uses about 100,000 transistors if you ignore the memories that support them. And so all the arms ever made, which is a big number, multiplied by all the transistors they use, which is a fairly big number, gives you about 10 to the 15. So all the arms in the world use 10 to the 15 transistors. And by an amazing coincidence, that's roughly the same as the number of synapses inside one human brain. So every transistor in every arm um, equals in number the synapses inside your head, um, where your memories, your personality, um, essentially your life is built and stored. We'll come back to that. BBC Micro might seem a long time ago to many people in the room, um, but computers go back a bit further than that. Um, and indeed, I'm, I'm from Manchester University, so it's fairly hard for me to give a talk without showing you a picture of the Manchester baby, which was the world's first stored program computer. So it was the first computer that you could load the program in and run it the way we do all the time with our computers today. Um, it was a historic milestone in the development of computers. That was 1948, um, which is actually before I was born, um, let alone most of the 
undergraduates in the room. Uh, the BBC Micro was before they were born. Um, but it's not that long ago. You know, 1948, we, we just had the 60th anniversary last year. If you look at the sort of technology we're using today, uh, this is um, a processor that will be in your phone if you have a sort of reasonably upmarket smartphone. It's an ARM9. Um, they look a bit like this. It's a piece of silicon chip. Um, chip designers love these kind of pictures, and I suppose they're completely meaningless to almost everybody else. Um, but that's one of my views of the world. Um, let's compare those two computers to see what's happened to the technology in the 60 years that it's existed. So the baby computer um, wasn't a monster, but it was pretty big. It was built in post office racks, which are about this high. And if you line them all up, as they're shown in that picture, they'd be about the width of this screen here. Um, in fact, if you really want to see what they look like, there's a replica of the baby in the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry. Um, and every Tuesday lunchtime, the enthusiasts who are old enough to know about valve technology come along and fire it up and run some programs. But the baby machine uh, used about three and a half kilowatts of electricity. Um, that's about the same as uh, the maximum power you can get from an electric fire. Um, and it executed about 700 instructions a second. If you take today's technology, the processor here fills a square millimeter of silicon, depending on precisely which technology it's on. It uses about 20 milliwatts of electrical power, and it executes 200 million instructions per second. Now, you can put those numbers together uh, to form one of the most important numbers that describes how good a computer is, which is its energy efficiency. How many miles per gallon or kilometers per liter uh, does the computer use? And uh, that computation tells you that the baby machine used about five joules to execute an instruction, and the modern power efficient processor executes something with a lot of zeros after the decimal point. Um, take the ratio of those two, and you get one of these astronomical numbers that keeps coming up in computer technology. Modern computers are something like 50,000 million times more power efficient than the earliest computers. And that's progress that enables the electronic toys in your pocket today. Um, you know, imagine if over those 60 years we hadn't done quite as well and that modern computers were, say, only 50 million times better than the early ones. That's still a big improvement, but you wouldn't have a mobile phone because the battery would have to be a thousand times bigger and uh, it wouldn't fit in your pocket anymore, and you wouldn't want to carry it around. So that kind of level of progress underpins uh, a lot of what's happening in electronics today. It's a big number. It's, it's very hard to get your head around numbers this big. Um, an interesting figure I heard recently is that the UK road transport fleet, all the cars, lorries, buses, use about 50,000 million litres a year of fuel. Um, so if, if cars and lorries had improved in their fuel efficiency by the same ratio, one litre of fuel would keep the entire UK road fleet going for a year. Now, I know there's lots of good engineering reasons why it's harder to make cars more fuel efficient than computers, um, but it gives you a feel for, for how dramatic this progress has been. It's all based on microchip technology, and this is a slightly old microchip, but this is the kind of thing that, that's now being engineered. Um, it's a close-up of the surface of a chip, and if you look very carefully, what, the transistors are down here. This stuff is just metal wiring that joins them together, and if you look, you can see there's three levels of wiring on this chip. Now, if this was one of today's chips in a mobile phone, and you amplified it, you expanded the picture to this size, then that chip would be larger than the Warwick University campus. So it's that level of detail expanded over a vast area. And within 10 years, if you did the same thing with the chips from 10 years from now, the chip will be larger than the greater Manchester metropolitan area. It will be 100 square miles um, at this kind of resolution. So these are formidable bits of engineering. And the fact that you can buy them for next to nothing, carry them around in your pocket, and throw them away when you get bored with the look of your mobile phone is, 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 is 
there's a sort of miracle of engineering going on inside there that most people really don't know about, probably don't care about, but, it, but that's what is making this possible. Um, and, and my research in microchip design is involved in understanding how to use the formidable complexity in these tiny little things that, that go inside your phone um, or iPod. Uh, another analogy that may be useful to you here is if you take the wiring of one of today's microchips, the job of designing it is roughly on the same scale as the job of designing the entire road network of the planet, including footpaths, from scratch. And you have to do all that. You have to design the traffic flow so there's never a traffic jam and there's never a crash, otherwise the chip will fail. Um, and, and, and that's the job of the, of the chip designer. Now, um, there's another perspective on what's on the, the surface of a chip. It's a very elegant and complex three-dimensional structure with the transistors just lying in two dimensions in the plane surface of the silicon and then these complex buildings of, of interconnect that wire them together. Most people have heard of Moore's Law, which is, um, well, not what any physicist would call a law. It began in 1965, which is off the left of my graph, when Gordon Moore wrote a famous paper, and he predicted that for the next 10 years, the number of transistors on the chip would double every 18 months, so his prediction ended about there. And what you see is it's carried on right up to today, and it's not quite run out of steam yet, although there is trouble ahead. Um, but there's always been trouble ahead, so we shall see. Now, if you presented this as your physics A-level experimental result, you'd get told off for obviously having cheated because your points lie much too close to the straight line. Uh, the left axis is logarithmic, so every time you cross a horizontal line, it's a factor of 10 on this picture. And the reason the points continue on this line is that this has moved from being an observation about the chip industry to being the major central boardroom planning tool. So if you work in the boardroom of a semiconductor company and you want to know where you have to be in 10 years' time, then you plot this straight line, stick a point on it, and then work out how much it's going to cost you. And that will usually frighten you. It will be a formidable amount. Um, another illustration of where this technology has got us to are these tiny things that we take for granted. Um, here's a micro SD card. It looks very big on the screen, but if you've got a phone, you'll know that these, these are tiny things. This is 12 gigabytes. There's no cheating on these memory cards. If there's 12 gigabytes, that's 96,000 million bits. Well, there's a bit of cheating. They put two bits on a transistor. That means you only need 50,000 million transistors inside this tiny little package in order to implement the functionality, which you can now buy for about 20 pounds. Um, back in the 1950s, transistors cost $500 each. You can work out what this would cost at 1950 prices. It's more than the GDP of most countries. And yet we buy these and use them for all sorts of frivolous stuff. I have my entire CD collection on my phone for no good reason other than that it'll fit. Um, now, the fact that it fits easily onto one of these cards could tell you something about how impressive the technology is, or it probably tells you something about how sad my CD collection is. But um, either way, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. And what's enabling this um, is that we've found ways to turn the stuff we want to carry around with us into numbers. So everything on the memory card is just ones and noughts. Um, and we've worked out good ways and efficient ways of putting photos uh, into ones and noughts, putting movies into ones and noughts, putting music into ones and noughts. Of course, we haven't quite got everywhere yet. Um, this is probably moving into Ian's territory. Um, but we haven't worked out how to encode smells as ones and noughts. And, and our, our management of touch you know, all the other, I talked about sound and vision, they're, they're pretty much done. Smell, touch, other senses um, are still interesting areas to think about. Um, and in order to build these systems, we have to think about the balancing of three forces. The design of any computing or information processing system has to have some kind of balance between its ability to store information, to process it, and to communicate it. And that, that view is true at pretty much every scale. OK, so brains. Um, 
you, all, you, you know by now that I, I'm a chip designer, I'm a computer engineer, I make electronic stuff. Um, and that's my research area, so why am I deviating into this area of brains which uh, you probably think belongs to neuroscientists or psychologists or, well, certainly other people. And the answer is that the brain is an information processing system, it's a control system, um, and it has interesting properties that we struggle to achieve with our computers. Brains are massively parallel, you have about 10 to the 11 neurons, all they do is sit inside your head going ping every now and then. Everything you are is just the pinging of 10 to the 11 neurons. And that's quite a strange thing to think about and get your head around. They're very highly connected. Um, I've mentioned the 10 to the 15 synapses. Those are connections between neurons. And then getting a bit closer to engineering, um, it's astonishingly power efficient. The stuff inside your head um, is the order of a million times more power efficient than the best microchips we know how to make. So I'm going to talk about a computer that starts to emulate the brain. If you had one of those, instead of consuming the 20 watts that your head does, it would consume 20 megawatts. The good news is you'd never have to worry about dieting again. Um, the bad news is you probably wouldn't have enough time to eat enough food to keep it going. Uh, so efficiency is important for biology. And, and it's very good at it. Some of the secret of this is that Unlike computer designers who strive to make every component go as fast as possible if they want to achieve performance, biology works with low performance comp components. So um, nothing inside your head is really going much faster than the order of millisecond timescales. Whereas inside my processors, I'm now measuring functions in tens of picoseconds, so uh, a million times faster. Also, chip designers often tell you how frustrated they are by the speed of light limitation. They can't get signals across the chip fast enough. That's not a problem for biology. The communication is running at meters a second. It's nowhere close to getting troubled by the speed of light. Brains are adaptive. Um, and this is a key. The, the technology that's coming down the road for chips is getting less reliable, not more. And we're having to worry about how to survive component failure on our chips keep the things functioning. And biology gives us an excellent example that this is achievable. So while you're sitting there listening to me, um, you're losing about one neuron a second. Um, and that'll continue throughout your adult life. Don't panic. Over 70 years, it only represents about 1 or 2% loss. It's not a problem. If you lose 10 or 15%, that is a problem. And it generally has a complicated medical name to go with it. Um, but we're interested in understanding how these things happen. So, what are neurons? Well, lots of biology, um, but basically they're just little cells that go ping. One view of neurons is that, is that they're different from other cells because they don't just interact with the cells around them. They actually choose which other cells to interact with. They grow, they project um, effectively wires along which they send their pings and they decide which other neurons they're going to interact with. Um, so the, 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 the connectivity is not only large scale, it's also complex in its organization. Um, they're flexible components. They seem to be useful from small numbers to big numbers. So very simple animals get away with a few tens of neurons. Honeybees in the middle there have just under a million. We have 10 to the 11. They seem nice and scalable. They work in small numbers. They're useful in middle-sized numbers there very beneficial in huge numbers to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have them because they cost, even though they're very efficient, they cost energy and uh, we need to justify their existence. Otherwise, we wouldn't pay for them in energy terms. There's lots of regularity in the brain from high level structures to low level. Um, the beeps tell me I haven't got time to go into this. So the motivation for the work is can we use massively parallel computing resources to accelerate our understanding of what's happening in the brain? And can our growing understanding of what's happening in the brain point the way to building more efficient computers? And that's the objective of the research. We're building a mighty machine um, with a million processors in it, uh, with connectivity patterns designed for brain emulation purposes. Um, there's lots of chip technology in here. These chips are very complicated. We're using lots of them, so the system diagram is complicated at several levels of hierarchy. 
Um, where could it lead? Well, a week ago in Manchester, this little fellow paid us a visit. He's a humanoid robotics platform. Um, all the mechanics is there, but there's no brain. And we're interested in collaborating with people who want to try and build the brain for this sort of robot. Um, people are developing ideas about how cognitive systems function, but there's, there are still fundamental mysteries at the heart of the operation of the brain. Um, and this kind of system is designed to provide a platform for, t for testing hypotheses. And we collaborate with psychologists and neuroscientists who usually generate these hypotheses and provide them with a platform for testing those to see how they work in practice. So, I better finish. I hope I've convinced you that we've come an awful long way in 60 years of computer technology, but we've still got some way to go before we compete with biology. Um, we don't know how the brain works. There are key mysteries in there, but it seems to me they're good things to worry about and think about. And um, parallel computers have a role to play in this game. Can they help us understand the brain? Can understanding the brain help us build better parallel computers? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Raise a hand. Anyone? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll come to you next. Okay, we just had a... Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, we just had a little flash of a picture of um, your design of a brain, and it was a torus. Uh, is there any exciting geometry in your design, or is it a series of black boxes? A series of what? Black boxes. Black boxes. Like, um, like baby. Uh, the, the, the torus reflects the fact that, that the machine is implemented as a large parallel system of communicating devices, and... Um, we have established that, that linking the devices in two dimensions is sufficient for the problem we're addressing. If you link them in two dimensions, then the obvious way to get the best communication is to wrap the two fold the two dimensions around into a torus, because that minimizes the longest path. But it's, it's, it starts from observing that two dimensions is enough, and of course two dimensions is very convenient for implementing on printed circuit boards. Um, the high-performance computing people will try and go for three, four, five, six dimensions, but we have a specific problem where we know the numbers and we, we believe two dimensions is sufficient and it's much easier to make. Lots of this is about what's easy to make, okay? Um, it's it's a, a, an enormous amount of work in building this machine at all. I think the second hand was, was yeah, hi. In, the, uh, in the back row there, well, not quite the back. Thanks for a great talk, and uh, I think you've probably, I'm sure you've amazed everyone with some of the facts and, and figures about the comparing the organic computing power of the brain with the electronics of even our best computers. But one of the things that's perhaps most striking is that, that the, the hardware, of course, on a microprocessor is fixed, but in a brain, new connections can form, and it's quite adaptive and plastic. Is this an insurmountable uh, challenge to... Um, computer science and engineering, or are there ways and techniques that you might be able to get over some of these fundamental difference between the silicon hardware and the biological hardware? Yeah, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, with current technology, we can't, have, we can't design chips that physically rewire themselves while they're running. We don't know how to do that. Um, but within the machine we're designing, uh, the wiring isn't, isn't, in a sense, physical, it's logical. Um, so there are maps built into memories that dictate where the connections are, and they can change at runtime. So an important goal of the machine is that it can support models of neural developmental processes, but it does this by logical rewiring rather than physical re rewiring. Um, 